Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I think I've met most of you one way or another across this thing. Uh, my name is John Beckford. I'm the current president of the Cybernetic Society. And um, I'm delighted to see so many faces turning up yet again this month. Um, the President Series of Events is designed as, a, as a, an exercise in transduction. Uh, it's an exercise in allowing people outside the cybernetic society to engage with people inside and people inside to engage with people outside in the hope that the exchange of ideas will generate fulfillment of some sort for all of us in whatever dimension we choose to interpret it. The important thing to say is that the, the speakers um, tonight, Abdul Aziz and Peter Cochran, um, are variously invited, cajoled, persuaded and beaten into, into, into coming along and, and, and talking. Um, so if anybody who's in the audience feels that they have something that they'd like to say at one of these events, then please let me know because there are always slots available uh, for people to fill up and the more different voices and noises we hear, the happier I shall be. Process for the evening is, as always, that we will invite Abdul to speak for 30 minutes. I shall put the timer on my phone when I can find it, Abdul, um, to, about his insights into his notion of the viable operating model. We'll take one or two questions, either live or from the chat at the end of that. Then we'll hear from Peter, who's going to talk about the notion that everything really is connected, Gaia and sentience. And if he, Peter looks really carefully over my left shoulder, he'll see Lovelock books up there on the top shelf. So uh, uh, Gaia is good, good territory for me. Um, and again, we'll, we'll ask Peter some, some questions. We will then try and synthesize the two very different talks. I'm pretty confident they will be very different tonight um, and, and see if we can distill some shared meaning or shared understanding out of them that we might want to take forward. Um, and by about 10 to seven, we'll probably all be fed up with each other and ready for our respective dinners, breakfasts or whatever else it is, depending on which part of the world you happen to be in. Please, as you are, remain on um, silent on your, on your various microphones, Mr. Dewhurst, if you wouldn't mind, um, so that we don't get cat noises coming in from, from stage left. Um, do make use of the chat facility to, to stick questions in because then I can make sure that we try and come back to them all. Um, and without further ado, I think, um, Angus, if you can let Abdul have control, um, I will happily introduce. Now, Abdul and I met, I think, about 10 years ago or thereabouts when he was reading for his master's degree at um, Manchester Business School, um, and Peter Kavalek, who's one of our one of our fellows and a, a previous speaker, um, introduced the pair of us to talk about the notion of viable systems, and we've had several enjoyable conversations over the years um, exploring that. Abdul is a business architect professionally, and um, is sharing with us tonight his thoughts on what a viable operating model might look like. I think in the context of business architecture, but. Uh, Abdul, you better explain rather, I'm sure you will explain rather better than I have managed to do so. So, Angus, if you can hand over control, I'll shut up. Thank you all very much. I have done. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it was, it was, I think, 10 years ago now. So, uh, it's uh, well recollected. Um, so, hopefully, my screen is sharing. Um, yeah, so I kind of first came across uh, the viable systems model te uh, ten, um, 10 years ago. Um, I was working with a systems practitioner and he kept on talking about variety and variety engineering and um, feedback and recursion. And I just didn't know what he was on about. Um, and um, I started to get uh, develop this interest in the viable systems model and, 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 and how we could apply it. Um, um, I then kind of recall that I did some soft systems methodology when, when I was a little bit younger, um, especially in my early days as a, as a business analyst. And uh, it's just been a kind of a process of connecting dots and trying to incorporate um, systems thinking and practice uh, in my work. Uh, so I'm not claiming that it is a proper interpretation of the viable systems model or, or some of the other systems ideas that I've come across. Uh, but what I'll try and do is, is, is share my experiences of how I kind of, uh, excuse me, how I've uh, 
I will try to incorporate those ideas with more contemporary practices like um, enterprise architecture uh, and deliver. Stop, stop for two seconds. You're, you may think you're sharing, but I don't know about others. I cannot see what you're sharing. Can anybody else? No, you're not sharing yet. So. Ah, sorry. Not press the share button. Apologies. Thank you. Sorted. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, and you'll have to just forgive me for the green. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so it's it's uh, hopefully I'll, I'll talk a little bit about systems thinking, my interpretation, uh, uh, enterprise architecture, and, and what that means uh, in, in in business and uh, delivery, and how 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 we actually kind of get things done. Um, so I kind of see there being three worlds: uh, the kind of the world of systems ideas and and, and practice, um, and kind of in the world of business uh, what we call enterprise architecture and solution design i know i know there are a couple of business on the call uh, i'm not sure um if these are familiar concepts to, to everyone but it's 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 when we talk about business model canvases and uh, capability maps and application catalogs and, and and all that good stuff um and then there's kind of a, a third world which is really about projects and programs and initiatives and and delivery and um, you know kind of the idea that the 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 idea of being agile and, and delivering and and what i'm trying to do with my work or what i have to do as part of my work is try and find synergy and connections between these these three worlds so um like it or not organizations are a dominant feature of our lives whether we're working in them or kind of consuming their products and they're increasingly becoming complex uh, and interconnected. Um, um, and I think kind of connecting these worlds a bit better uh, might make might help in, in kind of making them more enjoyable places to be in, and they might uh, it might help in actually making sure they they, they design and create and deliver things that we want. Uh, so there's a little um, um, paragraph there from. Uh, Patrick Hoopstat and, and, and the other person, I'm not sure what their full name is, and it's really about the idea of models. So we're all using models at work, whether we're aware of them or, or, or not. Um, and the viable kind of operating model, and um, I, I'm probably overusing the word viable here, uh, is my attempt at trying to kind of explicate um, uh, that model. Um, so some of the systems ideas I'm going to talk about in particular are viable systems model, um, soft systems methodology, and critical uh, systems heuristic. Um, and it's it's to be honest, it's just incidental that these three things are things that I've come across um, um, uh, and things that I find useful um, in kind of understanding structure and processes in organisations, um, understanding different perspectives when we're trying to solve a problem with or without IT, um, and then um, kind of dealing with dominant perspectives, um, to kind of put it politely. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about. Uh, please feel free to ask questions or, 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 or make comments along the way. I don't want to be a, a, a monologue, so um, we'll, we'll just make a start. Um, I'll, I'll just share kind of very briefly my, my, my thoughts. So, I don't mean to kind of um, provide a full account of, of viable systems model or, or the other two uh, systems approaches, uh, but maybe this will uh, explain my, my interpretation or, or understanding of it. So the, the viable systems model um, is, is really kind of, for me, it's about understanding how, how, can, how can management um, uh, regulate an organization which is, you know, um, hurtling through um, an uncertain environment. And it, and it sounds like a paradox um, initially, but then you kind of understand this, this idea of variety as a representation of, of complexity uh, and, and that we can intuitively um, balance or make things work a bit better. And that was pretty profound for me when I first came across this idea that, um, you know, these tools and techniques that I use, like business process engineering or marketing, you know, they're essentially attenuating and amplifying things. So that was a kind of pretty profound idea for me. And I've always tried to understand what that means in, in practice. Um, now, uh, don't try and use the viable systems model um, um, as a model in its own right, but I do try to 
pick out the kind of five functions um, in, 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 in my work. And that's really about understanding um, the operations and you know, what makes an organization uh, what it is, um, uh, trying to understand uh, how the organization coordinates those activities a bit better. Um, the, the idea of control and, and audit and intelligence policy. So I'm not going to go to the ins and outs of those. And the other idea I think I found really profound is the idea of recursion. The, you know, that, that's the kind of the natural way of m managing complexity uh, and what that means for, for organizations in terms of um, how their processes, uh, their systems and whatnot. So uh, an, an example really here uh, from my, from my um, career has been where we were establishing a, a service integration management organization, uh, effectively um, uh, an ICT organization to serve for the organizations in the, in the public sector. Now, naturally there was a lot of kind of duplication of, of, of functionality. So strategy and developing policies and standards and delivering IT services. But the, the VSM really helped in that it allowed us to recognize that um, whilst this new organization would be develop, you know, developing strategy and, and, and doing all these good things, there, there had to be some redundancy. So they had to also happen in their respective uh, ways as well. So, you know, you couldn't just say the new organization will do strategy for everyone. The new organization will do planning for everyone. The new organization um, um, uh, would be um, um, auditing for everyone. So. So that's an example um, that, that we can go into if, if anyone's interested. Um, I'll probably do this. I'll canter through. Can, yeah. um, I'll probably kind of canter through the next few slides in the same way. So, kind of understanding soft systems methodology. So, uh, here really, um, what, what I'm trying to do is understand that there are different perspectives, and that sometimes when when, when we face a problem, that that problem itself is kind of assumed and that sometimes we need to step back a little bit. Um, now, a lot of what we do in the world is dominated by technology uh, and, and automation of processes and, and we're working really hard to try and, you know, find that solution that works and, and be quick and agile, but sometimes you, you have to kind of take, take that step back um, and logically understand uh, what the situation is and go through that process. So. Uh, soft systems methodology really helps me to to, to develop uh, an operating model uh, without actually necessarily going through every single step but it allows uh, me to work with, with with stakeholders to understand different perspectives and and, and to understand um, the transformation process uh, itself uh, as a value stream and the kind of the surrounding uh, the, the world views of, of, of the stakeholders involved uh, as well so it, it, it it complements um, the viable systems model and the structure and the, and the great stuff it does on emphasis by allowing us to also surface different perspectives. Uh, so, so for me, they, they, they work together uh, really well. So again, I wouldn't kind of just go through soft systems methodology by myself. It would be through just using uh, the operating model canvas, which I'll introduce um, very shortly. Uh, and last but not least, um, the, the methodology I probably know least about, but I probably care for the most is really the, the idea of, um, di you know, understanding um, uh, who, who, who's kind of involved and who's affected by that system. So quite often when we're introducing technology and, and change, um, um, we might not be involving all the stakeholders in the right way um, at the right time. Um, it generally tends to be kind of after the fact uh, um, ra ra rather than right at the beginning. So uh, critical system heuristics really helps because it, it allows you to um, kind of realize that there's no single right way necessarily of doing things. So, um, it allows you to appreciate that every time someone segments a customer in a certain way or cuts a process in a certain way that they're, they're, they're making they're making a, a distinction uh, which has implications ultimately whether that's within the realms of the organization or 
um, wh whether, whether that's outside. Um, so kind of with that said, um, I, I try and bring all these string three things together. Apologies, there's a lot going on this slide, but that, that, that first row there really is about what, I, what, what we could call conventional or reductive thinking. It's the idea that you go into an organization and you develop a strategy. And for some people that's a goal, for others it's something a bit more broader. Um, for systems thinkers, it's about structural coupling and knowing what you what you couple with and then you go through a process of development enterprise architecture uh, and, and I make a point of it being not IT architecture which is um, a fun conversation in itself but really about un interpreting that strategy uh, structurally um, and last but not least operations so that first role kind of represents I think the, the systematic view of how we get from strategy to result whatever that might be uh, and then when I think about it, the kind of the systems approach at a very high level, that second role really is about understanding that purpose and structure and, and, and performance are kind of at the center of understanding systems uh, and their complexity. Um, and when I look across those, th those two things, I, I, I see kind of, I, I'm able to think of three three key business architecture concepts that of business capabilities you know what 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 the organization does um the process how it does it and, and the product it delivers and that resonates really well with with, with customers and stakeholders in the organization it, you know talking about products, um um it, it's, it's it's a really concrete physical kind of thing um you know so so we know what we're talking about uh, when we talk about processes, uh, again, it's, 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 it's a logical concept, it's, it's highly visual, it, it's about how we do things, and when we talk about capabilities, it's a bit more abstract and a bit more conceptual. So I then kind of look across these things vertically and say, well, actually, strategy is really about understanding purpose, and if I can do that in terms of capabilities, and I don't really have to talk about all three things, or, or when I'm talking about processes, you know, I'm interested in transformations, but actually I'm not just interested in, 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 in transformations. I'm talking about how all the different parts uh, of the, the business, whether that's the organization or the policy, uh, how they're related and how, how they come together. And, and for me, then that becomes what enterprise architecture could be or, or, or ought to be. Um, and then moving across when we, when we think about product, well, actually we're really interested in performance and, you know, uh, the idea of, of actual purpose, uh, the de facto purpose is actually seen from, from what, what, what the organization provides. And when I say product, I, I mean both kind of goods and services, and that's what matters. So the, the, these are three kind of useful concepts for me in engaging with customers in kind of understanding their operating model. Um, and I thought it's a bit like um, the idea of Fleming's left-hand rule, they're kind of three orthogonal views, and it doesn't really matter much they, they, you know, they're, they're distinct, but, you know, customers take, talk about products. So I'll talk about products with you and fill your boots. We'll talk about it all day long. If you're interested in, in, in process, we can use that. And, and, and we get, then get to a stage where instead of saying, I do this, then that, then that, we can talk about all three things at the same time. So we can understand the capabilities and the processes and the products in, in lockstep. Uh, so they're the, they're, they're the three concepts um, um, that, that, that I find to be re re really helpful. Uh, and I suppose um, one other kind of analogy I draw is the idea that capabilities are a bit like potential energy. It's, it's what the organization can do, but not necessarily able to deploy it because you don't have, have the process. And, and the process is really about uh, where the rubber meets the, meets the ground. And, and when, when we talk about products, well, actually, if it's some goods, it's more kinetic it's more potential energy and if you if you if it's a service then you know you're delivering it and that, and that also helps as well um so um here, here are some examples of, of of capability maps so when i said what what an organization does uh, they're kind of fuzzy deliberately uh, because um uh, their work that i've done with real clients uh, and a key part and, and as an as an example um you know we might talk about business management or data management or technology management or customer relationship management is just understanding what an organization does and 
And what we can do is actually understand those capabilities in terms of their function. So at the far left, what you can see is the, is the five subsystem functions you know, that, that are necessary uh, for an organization to, to be viable. So by mapping the viable system subfunctions to the capabilities, I'm, I'm then able to kind of make an intermediary jump and say, well, okay, what, you know, the, these 20 capabilities, uh, which business unit uh, units uh, fulfill those roles and, and I can do that in terms of Raski. So it, it allows me to connect the, the five functions to things like business units and processes and technology in a way that's far more, um, I don't know if palatable is the right, right word, but a, a, a bit more real um, um, or a bit more kind of approachable to, 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 to most of the the people that, that I've worked with. Um, um, but this isn't to say that the viable systems model isn't necessary or, or anything. It's, it's just it does help us and, and kind of creating that connection a bit more. Um, uh, so this is the, the canvas, uh, the, the viable operating model canvas. Um, and, and for me, it's, 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 it's those three things that we spoke about, that product um, view, that they're the, they're the first three um, rows you can see, the process view, and the capability view. And that's really answering three questions in, in the way I describe viability. So that product that you're offering as an organization, um, does somebody want it? Is it desirable? Uh, the, the processes, are they, are they, kind of, are they feasible? So um, not only are, are they efficient, but are they effective? And, and kind of view on your capabilities. Um, are, are you able to do it? Um, and, it doesn't really matter much where you start. You can start with it, with with, it, with any block, uh, but it's really useful to tell stories. Say, for example, by starting at the top and saying, you know, I'm some customer and I engage with you as an organization uh, using a certain channel to, to get a certain product or, or, or a service. And here are the processes that get invoked. And, and data is really important because this is the data that I generate or create and, and whatnot. And, the, these are the in, in the management system. These are the policies uh, that come into force, and this is the performance that's required, and these are the resources that's re that are required. And and then you step down and say, well, within the organisation, these are the business units, and these are the roles that should fulfil that. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, the technology, um, uh, the information, and the operation technology that, that enable that. Um, for some people, you know, quite often you start at the bottom. And, and, you, and you wake way up. So that's the, the viable operating canvas at, at the highest level. Um, I'm conscious of the time and I really want to get to kind of more detail. So I just tried to explain um, some of that stuff at the highest level. What I've done here is to just shown um, uh, some structures below each of those. So say for example, customers, we can segment that into retail or commercial and, and segment them further. Um, and every time you, you segment things in a particular way, you, you know, from a VSM point of view, right, you, you, you're making decisions around how that variety proliferates. Uh, so again, without necessarily talking about it, you can say, well, it matters how, how you segment, uh, how you segment things. Um, or from an SSM point of view, you can say, well, okay, that's how you see the customers, but how do they see themselves? Um, or, or, or from a critical systems point of view, you can say, well, hang on, you're making some really big assumptions about who sits in this segment or, 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 another, uh, or another segment. Um, so again, um, what I try to do here is try to incorporate, um, uh, depending on what the situation is or what the problem is or what the solution might be, um, uh, different aspects of, 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 of the VSM, uh, the soft system that's on CSS, CSH, uh, in trying to understand the current operating model, whatever that might mean, um, the target operating model, and, and, and understanding, understanding uh, that delta. Uh, different people naturally gravitate to different parts of the operating model. Um, and here again, uh, you, you know, from a viable systems model point of view at the very highest level you can say well actually uh, when you talk about technology management or data management just being about coordination well actually it's not just the business unit that fulfills that um, it, it's um, um, you know a certain process or um, a, a certain uh, strategy that you've got here um, 
or, or assistive in technology enabling those things. Um, um, so it just provides you, us a way of talking about the, the bigger picture uh, and, um, and, and also focusing on, on detail uh, when we need to. Uh, so apologies, I'm not kind of able to show um, a real example. Uh, I have a few, I've had to kind of blur them out, but they're for different types of organizations. So at the highest level, so uh, for, for a healthcare organization, uh, a mental healthcare organization, um, um, ICT organizations, data analytics organizations, and insurance organizations, and they tend to look quite different. The problems and challenges that you, that you face are, um, are quite different. Um, um, and, and you're able to kind of um, introduce concepts and ideas without necessarily um, undertaking uh, uh, those models, um, per se. I think that kind of gets me towards the end of the slides. Um, um, I suppose the, the final thing I said, those three worlds kind of coming together, um, and what, what, what I meant by that was, um, there isn't much appetite for enterprise architecture in the world. And I don't know that there's much appetite for systems thinking and practice in, 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 in real delivery either. Um, and what I think the viable kind of operating model, I don't know whatever in that, can do is it can kind of give us that sketch of, of what the organization uh, might look like. Um, it incorporates, you know, systems ideas at a very high level. Uh, we're, we're able then kind of off the back of that to develop requirements as, as user stories to say, okay, as a customer, this is what I want from the system. And, and um, this is an acceptance criteria or as someone who works within the system, uh, you can develop uh, uh, user stories that talk to a model and vice versa. Um, and then that world then houses agile delivery. So then it's about kind of getting multiple disciplinary teams together that can draw up an architecture, just enough architecture and, and deliver it in, 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 in a scalable way. So kind of really piloting and trying things. So try that process, um, deploy it and, and, and then scale it. Um, and if it, if it doesn't sound kind of, kind of too grandiose, it, I, 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 you know, I've experienced, you know, good parts of models here and there and different clients, uh, with different clients. It's never all kind of come together perfectly, uh, but I think it can help uh, at a very high level. Um, I'll probably stop at that point because I think I've gone for about half an hour. Um, um, and I don't know if, if there's any questions immediately now. Uh, or whether we want to move on to. Um, uh, if, you, if you stop sharing, Abdul, so we can see everybody's happy faces again. Um, there's some, you know, some some questions starting to oh. appear now in, in in the chat, which are which are really good, um, and I'm delighted. That I've got some awkward ones for you, as you can can, can imagine. Um, so so Seymour Hirsch, I, I can't see one on the screen at the moment. Uh, Seymour's asking for a copy of your slides, and and, and that's in the in the chat, Abdul. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but I think he's a bit startled by your, um, um, what was it you said, did I hear right companies are not applying business architecture? So perhaps you'd like to say a little bit more about, about the difficulty, if you like, of, 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 that you're referring to. Um, so I think um, there's a, um, especially I've kind of noticed it increasingly now, maybe over the last nine to 12 months, uh, um, we live in a world where you know there are big kind of cloud um, offerings out there in terms of kind of platform and infrastructure services. Uh, so I find that a lot of organisations think kind of solution design and, and agile delivery is enough to to get them kind of over the line. Um, uh, uh, so 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 the way the way I see it, it's like you know you, you've got a strategy or an intent or or, or an idea, and if 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 it isn't particularly transformative, you can kind of get to it and start making changes. Uh, if, if you think it's, there, there's lots of things to align, then you, then you need architecture, whether that's, you know, you're drawing a picture or, or doing something a bit more sophisticated. 
Um, I get the impression uh, at the moment in the current climate, people are more, we call it technical debt, and, and people will, will just say, yeah, that's just technical debt or, or it's process debt. And I, I hear that more and more. Uh, you know, we, 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 could, we can do it, we can fix it later. The, the saying is, you know, you know, you never have time to do things right, but you always have time to, time to, to fix it. Um, so yeah, our architecture is seen as being somewhat academic. And I guess in, in some respects, that's the story of my life. I'm kind of not academic enough to, well, I'm not academic enough in that I'm an academic, but I'm, I'm, I'm probably um, at the other end of things when, 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 I'm, when I'm in business. So I'm kind of towing the line a little bit. But at, the, at the same time, I think architecture has to be useful, right? It has to, it has to help guide and deliver things. So I think architecture needs to make itself more useful in business. I think, um, sorry about that, there's one of those blasted alerts on my phone that you can't get rid of unless you put the phone in water, apparently. Um, and then it doesn't work very well as a telephone afterwards. Um, I think yeah, there's a, there's a, um, there seems to be a demand in organisations at the moment for, for instant solutions, rapid solutions, without necessarily the thoughtfulness that you've described in, in that process. How much of a frustration is it, Abdul, when you're trying to use these ideas? Um, sometimes I get asked, to, does it anger you? And, and I said, I, I pretty much say, it never, it doesn't anger me. It, 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 it's, um, and I don't think it even frustrates me. It's almost, um, um, it's, it's more a case of um, trying to balance uh, the, the problem, the here and now versus the there and then, right, in, in viable system methodology. Uh, it, it, what I try to do with the operating model is say, look, this is a mirror and present it back to the organization and say, look, it's your decision to make. Um, and, um, you, know, you know, as long as we give each other enough time to just kind of be able to tease things out and, and share things it, it, it's your decision so as long as we're able to have those conversations um you know I, I feel like i'm trying to do my best in terms of adding value um and it, and it lands with people in different ways at different times so with with some clients um you know you'll talk about variety and they're like oh did you say variation and what's, what's the difference between variation and six sigma and variety and variability and and all that good stuff and they get really excited so sometimes it's it's helpful uh sometimes you you, you say oh, well after the fact oh you know well, you know we, we were using this technique or that technique and then they get they get interested in it as well so um not so much frustrated but as long as you know as long as i get the chance to show the mirror i think i've 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 i've, I've done something useful on my side of things anyway at least that's cool. So I wrote down as, as you were talking, I mean, some, some great comments in the in the chat, which you, you need to read um, for your own benefit, if, if not for any other reason. Um, while, while you were talking, because um, I was I was making a mental comparison between um, Flood and Jackson's yeah, Total Systems Intervention and the idea of, uh, of the sort of system of systems methodology, which you know, which viable operating model as you described, it has shades of that, but it's different. Um, so I was I was listening to and, and seeing in, in my interpretation um, a lot of cybernetics in the relationship between the, 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 the stages, particularly the use of information in there. But I particularly struck, and I wanted to ask you about um, when you talked about CSH, who owns ought? Because when we talk about cybernetic systems, we're describing systems which I think are purposeful and they're and, and they're adaptive and when you ask the question about ought so who ought to own this who ought to benefit who ought to be responsible that for me is is, is a really really big sort of philosophical question that then informs your answer to the question of purpose which then links you back in, into the other three so do you, do you have thoughts on that uh, so yeah i mean that, that's what i when, when i initially said it's kind of incidental that i um, uh, so so kind of Professor Michael Jackson's uh, system of system methodology is kind of there, it's that unitary, uh, pluralistic and coercive idea and the idea of, you know, things being static and dynamic and I just call that a risk, risk continuum. So it's just incidental that these three methodologies allow you to kind of 
get people into that set middle ground to, 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 to spend a bit more time on problem formulation rather than, 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 than doing it. But in the York is very interesting. So there's a big drive for kind of becoming data driven at the moment in organizations. So data analytics is a big thing. So on the one hand, we talk about empowering people at the front line. Uh, and on the other hand, we're talking about um, you know, using increasingly um, more algorithms to make decisions. Um, and, and the OR is a very, very, very interesting uh, thing, right? The idea of bias being introducing into algorithms in, 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 the, in the first place. Um, so um, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a very interesting question and organizations deal with it in quite, quite different, quite different ways. So um, again, so from my point of view, what I try to do as best I can is use the operating models to surface those things. So one of the things I will do is I will look to map stakeholders to different operating model boxes. And I suppose the thing that I've missed is what, what I say is like, oh, everyone designs a great little box. So everyone de designs a great little segmentation. And everyone designs a great little policy and everyone designs a great little technology. Uh, the, 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 the real benefit is can we start to draw connections between these things uh, and get different stakeholders to, to, to talk together, to get together. That's, that's, that's brilliant um, as, as, as an answer and both as, as a segue into our next speaker. So um, we will be coming back to you, Abdul, a little later on. Um, so um, everybody, I'd like to now introduce uh, Professor Peter Cochrane. Peter is one of, of a small number of honorary fellows of the Cybernetics Society. Um, and I'm just reading what we what we put on Eventbrite, Peter, because you wrote this, so we know it's correct. Um, he's a seasoned professional, decades of hands-on management, technology and operational experience, retired from BT in 2000 um, as Chief Technical Officer and has been involved with the founding of eBookers, Shazam Entertainment and a raft of smaller startups. So um, enough said, um, Peter. I'd, I'd, Peter is going to talk about, and I, I'm, again, I'll get the title right, Gaia and Sentience, and this is the segue back to, to Abdul, everything really is connected. So Peter, over to you. I'll give you a nudge in, uh, in half an hour uh, if you need stopping. Thank you. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen straight away uh, and just get into this. Right. Uh, so as much as the, uh, the previous talk was about being in control, this talk is about being out of control. And I mean, seriously out of control um, in the, the network space and in the uh, internet of things space, uh, things are, we design them, but they then do their own stuff. So I want to explore this uh, in this context. Um, and, uh, and that is the original Gaia hypothesis was a, a, from a, a chemistry vision it was about all living things. And um, it was actually a shortfall because it turns out that Gaia applies over a much, much wider area, including the technology uh, and people. So here's the big picture. And uh, it really is uh, this situation. Uh, our, our world is just one uh, very big uh, connectome. Uh, we are uh, connected uh, from the very start, from uh, stardust onwards. And um, every living thing, it turns out, is um, uh, connected uh, both at a chemistry level, but also at a genetic level. Um, it's not so much that we came from apes, more likely we came from an apple or, or a blade of grass or, or a fungus. Um, it, uh, it goes back that far. The problem is that all our information in this area is extremely vague. The error bars are enormous. And, um, and so where first intelligence arrives is not certain. Uh, it's certainly possible from algae uh, upwards. And then the first sentience, um, I'm going to uh, explain where that kicks in and how it kicks in. And uh, I've got some uh, mathematics for you that I've uh, sanitized to make it as uh, simple as possible. And uh, I always remember Stephen uh, Hawking's uh, quote when he was going to write, uh, write his book uh, uh, about the universe. He, um, 
the printers or, or the editors said to them, you know, every every time you put an equation in, you'll halve the audience. So I've got one equation. I thought I'd try and hang on to the audience. So here it is. This is the reality. And the time scales are vast. So a lot of people argue about causality and, um, you know, you, things can't possibly happen like this. Well, I'm afraid they can over vast uh, time spans of billions of years. And actually, our, tele, our technology, the AI and the robotics and the sentience uh, that we're now edging towards are all part of the same uh, biological process, only we're actually physically building the stuff. Um, and so here's a, an interesting view, I thought, and it's absolutely spot on. Um, everything. Uh, that shares the stardust, the chemistry, the biology, the genome. It makes progress by making errors. That's it. There's no plan. Uh, just a series of random errors uh, comes up with the coronavirus uh, and everything else. So the great news about this is this gross inefficiency inherently makes the system phenomenally reliable and resilient. Uh, all efficient systems. Uh, are prone to collapse quickly, inefficient systems will stand up to an awful lot of punishment. And um, we are the only species uh, on the planet that optimizes anything. So here's uh, a bit of thinking uh, on the situation. And the key questions are, where the heck is all this heading? And uh, do we understand it? And the answer is, we don't know. And uh, we don't know. <laughs> uh, we, we understand quite a bit, uh, but there's an awful lot of systems that we do not. And uh, we're having in many areas, not only to let go of the technology, but also let go of the organization. Uh, the kind of structures that require lots and lots of uh, tabulation and organization and bolting down tend to be the ones that are producing uh, concrete or processing things and everything is known. But if you get into a creative industry, the last thing you need is order and constraints uh, by ranking of people and reporting chains. So this is sort of uh, something that's happening right across the board. Um, but a key thing is, and a lot of people who object to what we're doing in technology, I will say to them, without the technology, we die. It feeds us, it closes us, it provides our power. It keeps us healthy, but best of all, it amplifies our capability. Uh, without this laptop and with you without yours, you become powerless. You just can't remember all this stuff. And the internet now is as much a part of us as, as everything else. So the question is, uh, will the network that we're now building become sentient and where does the evolution take us? So here's the world that I, was, I came into. It was a static world that was slow with very few nodes and very few connections. This kind of a network you could design with great precision. You could tell what it was going to do and it was true engineering. Now, this is the kind of engineering they're doing. We build the thing, stand back and then utter some profanity at the, what it's doing because we didn't expect it to do this. These are spontaneous connections uh, in networks. It's not necessarily um, a topological graph. Um, it it uh, is more of a, a, a connections graph. So um, this actually applies uh, in some sense to social networks, but it, it also applies to uh, the Internet of Things. And surprise, surprise, most of the things on the Internet of Things will never connect to the Internet at all. They will talk to each other and very occasionally they will get connected to the Internet. And so that's a topic for another day, but this animation just typifies that. So at a fundamental level, the, the elemental questions uh, look like this, and here is a big problem. We've had thousands of years of philosophers thinking and pontificating about all of this. And uh, reality is uh, there's lots of words, there's absolutely no models, and there's nothing that an engineer can use. And if you actually look at the statements, they're pretty meaningless. Uh, sentience, the quality of state of consciousness, 
doesn't help if you're trying to build something. If you refer to the religions of the world, well, they were all put together by people who um, hundreds or thousands of years ago knew very little, and uh, it was uh, an excuse for uh, not understanding. And so there is literally nothing out there. So I've looked at uh, hundreds of descriptions of intelligence and sentience and um, decided that I've got to take some uh, different kind of approach. So uh, this is uh, a sort of a, a slight joke on the left. Uh, discussing the number of angels on a pinhead doesn't help. And uh, discussing what um, intelligence and sentience is uh, just uh, gets very tiring. So I rather have this view. Uh, it's quite permissible for the uh, physicist, the chemist, the biologist, the mathematician to, to declare that there's a problem has no solution. We don't enjoy, enjoy, enjoy that luxury in engineering. Companies call me, they've got a problem, they want to fix, even if the problem is impossible to solve. And so what we are as engineers, it seems to me, is artists of finding a bounded solution, something that will do the job and it will do it within certain bounds. Now, it turns out the vast majority of things that we use, we don't fully understand. Let me give you one example, a transformer. We do not even know what a magnetic field is. Sure, we can measure it. Sure, we can characterize it, but we do not actually know what a magnetic field is. In much the same way, no one knows what the genome is. Sorry, the, uh, um, yeah, the, the genome is it, 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 it's, uh, in its finest detail or how things relate, but they are able uh, to use it in the same way that people are using stem cells with no knowledge. And, and so it, this is not an excuse on my, my part, but the appliance uh, of science is what we're up to. And the science is very often lacking or not existing, but we've still got to find a solution. So that uh, has always been my mantra. And um, it shouldn't stop us exploring. And very often, science itself is created by somebody coming from the outside in. And uh, if you want to see some interesting lectures on that, Richard Feynman uh, is on uh, YouTube, and there's some good uh, descriptions of that actually happening. So I now want to load on you the, uh, the, the weight of uh, evidence for what I'm about to delve into. Um, this is what we actually know. And the questions are, or my hypothesis is, that most life forms appear to uh, exhibit intelligence. Uh, there are a few that do not, but the bulk seem to. So I'm going to sweep away those that don't. And uh, you have to have intelligence uh, before you can get sentience. And not all life is sentient. Um, but it is intelligent. So um, autoimmunity um, is present in some life forms, but not others. Um, it used to be thought even six years ago that you couldn't get intelligence and you couldn't get centrins without a central nervous system. That's been uh, uh, shot in the head, if you like. It, it, it's no longer taken as being true. And certainly things don't have to produce to be qualified as being living. So on the virus, uh, the jury is out. I, re I rather take the view that it is a life form and it's a Borg-like parasite. It subsumes host cells. Um, a dumb uh, virus will kill the host. A smart virus allows the host population to live. That plays direct into um, the cybersecurity world, which is where I work a lot of the time, and the internet of things. The smart cyber criminals allow the host to live and so they can keep milking it. The idiots wipe out the uh, target and then uh, they, they lose in, in the long term on that. So there are many, many more uh, of these exceptions, but um, you can uh, waste a lot of life worrying about these. And I prefer to focus on exactly what we do know nail it down and see what we can come up with and then test the model we come up with against our experiences and see if it works. So here's uh, some of the 
uh, crossover, if you like, between plants and animals. And uh, plants tend to have um, rather hard shelled, um, squarish cells. Uh, animal cells are rather blob like. And um, the plants are closely knitted, the cells are well spread out. And when those animal cells want to communicate, they spit out what is almost a tube for a chemical transfer that looks pretty much like some of the electronic animations I'm gonna run for you. And so all of the life forms, right from a blade of grass to us, shares a common uh, DNA uh, thread. Now, one of the, the things that is extremely frustrating for the human race is we can't understand our own brain. And what is more, um, Thermodynamics tells us that we'll never understand our own brain with our own brain. In fact, um, we are going to need at least a quantum computer to be able to do it. But um, we can get more and more insights. And indeed, the brain uh, of people and animals has been used as a, a sort of thinking platform for the structure uh, of neural networks uh, in, in AI. So here's uh, a little bit of evidence. This is slime mold. Uh, it isn't an animal, it is a, a colony of individual cells that come together. Uh, they will split up and hunt, and then they will come back, get the colony together and attack the food source. They've been used for solving uh, maze problems. Uh, they have memory, they have intelligence, and this is probably at the almost the base level of where sentience starts. Another example of uh, mapping brains doesn't tell you anything about the animal or what it does. The map or connectivity of a brain of um, a nematode is interesting, but it's about as useful as a roadmap of the UK when you're trying to decide how a society works. What is really surprised me, I mean, I've been studying this, is how many plants are actually really quite smart. Uh, the ones that are carnivores are particularly smart in the way that they remember um, which flies, which insects, um, one, are good to eat, two, when they need that sustenance, uh, and three, the best way of gripping them and, and drawing them in. And there are many surprises there. This one um, is just quite remarkable that we'd not figured this out, but uh, complete forests, the trees communicate each between each other using a, a surrogate method. They use fungi uh, to propagate information from one tree to another. Uh, this is another surprise. And so all the thinking on intelligent sentience going back uh, hundreds of years uh, is not just wrong, it's wrong in a very big way. Uh, and, and these revelations just make you uh, think more and more about what is really happening here. These have happened in the last two weeks while I've been putting this presentation together. Um, new life forms 900 meters uh, under the Arctic ice, we have no clue uh, what it does, whether it's sentience, whether it's intelligence. Um, the one for me that I discovered only a week ago is the cuttlefish. And an experiment has just shown that it communicates with other cuttlefish using polarized light. So this, this is really a, an advanced uh, optical communication system we didn't even know uh, existed uh, a month ago. Um, so the weight of ignorance now is that everything that people have done uh, in terms of um, looking at brain size as a measure of intelligence or looking at uh, flops or processing power multiplied by memory uh, is wrong uh, and it's wrong in a big way. And so we have to start thinking again about a lot of this, the assumptions. Um, this uh, graph by Hans Moravec is a good one where it was proje projecting human beings being overtaken by the uh, internet. Uh, and actually, uh, the internet's probably about as smart as a mouse right now, uh, but we just uh, don't know. So here is my forcing solution uh, to get us to first base. 
and I'm just going to lock down these statements. Life is an emergent uh, property of complexity. Intelligence is an emergent property of life, and sentience is an emergent property of intelligence, period. And I'm just going to go with that, and I'm going to put on a shelf the limited experiences, thinking, and models of humankind. Because what we do, what we think, and how we approach things is actually determined by the biology of us and the world we live in. But that doesn't fit yeah. in the world of networks uh, or yeah. in other uh, chemical uh, regimes. Yeah. So um, a further sort of endorsement of that, if you like, is that sentience is going to be defined largely uh, by our senses and uh, our actuators, the ins and the outs of the body. They tell us about the um, environment that we're in. And um, those vary from one species to other in a huge way. Moreover, <laughs> in our own species, they vary terrifically between the genders, between uh, the age groups. And uh, I rather think that there's something special going off here that we're, we've missed a trick. Um, some people like to make great play uh, about the male brain being bigger than the female brain. And one thing that's not obvious is that the female of the species seems to have more nerve endings on the skin surface uh, than the male. So I think it's a mistake to start trying to calculate human intelligence by looking at the brain because the brain extends down to your fingertips and to your toes to the extremities of the body and that's a different way uh, of looking at it and i'm finding it very difficult to um, uh, get the data together to actually uh, quantify some of this it, a lot of the work has yet to be done anyway here let's go here's it's, it's time to model and i've, I've stated the, the base premises we're going to make some moves and then we're going to test the moves and, and see uh, how it goes. So here's a simple animal. Uh, it's in an environment. It gets an input. Um, it's got a sensor. It's got an actuator. And there's some kind of feedback. And it does something. And, and, and there's a loop. It's a, an order one uh, problem. And we can solve that. But I've had to take a few uh, liberties. Uh, mathematicians do this all the time. They don't necessarily advertise it. But I don't care about the detail of the functions whatsoever, principally because it's impossible to characterize them. Um, all I'm interested in is the relative weightings. And so uh, this makes it uh, orders of magnitude easier to work with. So an enhancement of the, this animal is to give it some processor uh, power, no memory, just processing power and uh, give it a reflex uh, function, some uh, very short path between the sensor and the actuator um, is in most, uh, is actually in most life forms. And so then you, it's easy to characterize uh, uh, the system. And so I build the system bigger and bigger and make it really quite complex. But once we get up to order five and beyond, it's way we can't mathematically we can't sort that out it, we can't solve the equations and so um you you finish up effectively with a polynomial solution and i've done this for massive complexity where an animal has got um, lots of sensors and lots of actuators and lots of uh, processing power and memory and um what um I've had to do then is a, a bit of a dr johnson the the equations mean exactly what i uh, define them to uh, mean uh, not, not not the way you might think they are, but it, it's a question of just nailing down the definition. And so I come up with this grand uh, formula, and uh, I'm not expecting you to memorize this or anything stupid, but it's really uh, quite powerful uh, because it actually fits the facts uh, when tested. Um, so here is a. a sort of Hans Moravec kind of computation. Lots of people have had a go uh, and they get this kind of a picture. This is where our computers and our internet is. And um, this, this is just way off beam. It's obviously not right. 
that's where my model sits. And my model is an entropic model, uh, and that sort of is very re encouraging for this to emerge out of the mathematics because it fits nicely with information theory. Um, so uh, the IoT is going to be another order of magnitude. Let me demonstrate, uh, if you like, the rightness of this. Um, if you take a comatose patient and they've been comatose for eight to 10 years, there's absolutely no sign of life. But you whisper into their ear, I want you to imagine that you're playing a game of tennis then their brain activity goes up exactly the same as your, yours and mine. And that happens in about 60% of cases. So the nightmare is that 40% of these poor souls are, are actually um, entombed in meat space, if you will. And there's a, quite a bit of effort to try and give them a, a piece of communication. So what does this mean? It means uh, that their actuator, their output is zero. And so in this equation, uh, look at the A. If that goes to zero, you, you just get log two. Uh, sorry, you just get log one, and that goes to zero. So they don't appear intelligent. But we know that they are, but you, you can't access it. Um, so that's a tick in the box. The, the equation works. Um, now, the same happens to be true of um, a single cell. No processing, no memory, no reflex. I think it's got to have a reflex, sorry. It, it, it's got to have a reflex um, uh, to get um, uh, this, the, this uh, equation. And um, that actually works. In fact, uh, because it swims, uh, it's almost definitely got a, a, a little feedback there. So I'm pretty sure that is right. And so um, I, I've just repeated this for one uh, case after another. And I've, I've then said, well, this is how it looks. Um, it looks as though the actuators, uh, the outputs and the sensors delving into the environment powering the information through the processing, whatever it is, into the long-term memory, principally, gives the seat of sentience. That's it. So without uh, a memory, you have no sentience. Uh, you, you, it's fundamentally uh, impossible. So that gives me some uh, uh, encouragement. And uh, quite a few experiments on animals, and dogs in particular, shows a vast array of differences in their capabilities. It's not uh, surprising that we have um, hunting dogs and uh, sheep dogs. They all come with different skills. Uh, and these are now genetically bred in and uh, not entirely a surprise. So now let's just jump for a moment to the kernel of Industry 4.0. This is how it looks. Industry 4.0 is the first attempt by us as a species to create uh, industry and societies that are going to be sustainable. They're going to be based on new materials, not the old ones, biotech and nanotech. The AI and the robotics are key, especially the AI in design and realization of the materials and the build and make process, but all of it has a nervous system and it's the IoT. And this is where there's uh, quite a challenge. Um, is the, uh, I think, an underestimate of what is actually going to be rolled out, but it will absolutely uh, put everything else that we've ever done in the shade. We have no way of controlling this system. We have no way of designing it because the complexity is uh, orders of magnitude greater than uh, we, we can cope with. And so here's uh, an example. Uh, this is just one corner of the internet. Now, this looks uh, very sort of lifelike, and you'll see occasionally uh, just flashes. This is very reminiscent of a biological system squirting information over a, a distance from one node to another. And when you delve down, you find these very star-like uh, clusters, 
And so here are all, is all the addressing, and uh, I'm not sure whether I've included it or not, but uh, we're smack in the middle of the Department of Defense in the United States. That, that, that's their network. And uh, we now have to imagine that uh, on a global scale, uh, the heat map, again, looks very, very biological uh, on that scale. And then we have to start thinking of the IoT density, which is going to be hundreds to thousands of times denser than the internet. And uh, this really starts to look extremely biological in, in the way that it uh, behaves. And uh, I'm afraid we're just going to get emergent properties that are going to surprise us. And uh, it's going to provide us with some uh, interesting challenges. So let me, I'm bringing this to a close quickly, but let me give you an example. These are spontaneous clusters that arrive on the IoT. It's not been programmed to do this. Just like humans, it likes to cluster with its own or, or with things that have got features that it likes or it prefers. How this is happening uh, exactly, we don't know. But it sure is <laughs> beguiling. And you think, we, as an engineer, I want to understand how this... Um, is going to happen, how this is uh, happening and why. And the question is whether it'll let me find out. So the $64,000 question, uh, uh, there are two of them and here they are. So uh, the best one I think is, will we be smart enough to figure out that um, sentience has popped up? And uh, in fact, I think the big question is, has it already happened? And uh, malware might be a good, good, good place to go uh, take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my homepage is full of things like this. But the slide set for this uh, evening's presentation is on my homepage. Um, it's about second line down, in, so second tier down uh, under presentations. If you can't find it for some reason, if you go on to uh, SlideShare and just type in me, you, you will find it. It's the first slide. There. So uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for being a great audience and uh, very happy to uh, answer any questions. It's not video. It would seem sensible to take a very deep breath before asking a question on that, on that little lot. Um, I'd like to... Are you clapping or putting your hand up? I'm not quite sure which. I thought that... <laughs> May I ask a question? Uh, certainly. Away you go, Bernard. Thank you very much for the absolutely fabulous presentation. You've crammed so much in there. I mean, thank God I had to start a bit because I've been following, tracking some of the same things. Uh, not so much from the engineering, engineering side, but from the kind of psychology and sociology side and the biological side. Now, the question for me, which has haunted me about the sentience of, of uh, engineered systems, is that within biological systems, uh, or, or use the terminology of cybernetics, they are dynamic systems, they are um, self-organizing systems. Uh, there's a, they are, um, you know, materially open systems. And just like we, 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 we they float around that, uh, you know, that, that something's happening at the temperature at which they're, they're living. And the, in, the internal dynamics of the system uh, is a source of variety internal to, to the system, as well as the variety it captures by in, interacting with its environment. So, um, and many people said we, we won't get, uh, we, we need a medium or a self-organizing medium in which to uh, grow or, or, or um, uh, breed our, 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 our intelligent artificial systems and just uh, putting, um, bits and pieces of stuff together won't get us there, uh, no matter how, how complicated the connections between them are. Um, comment, please. I, I, I have to say, I think they're out of touch. We're already there. <laughs> I think that's already happened. Uh, the question is, um, if we're producing a, a real Gaia, then it will be self-regulating. Uh, and in actual, thing, think, actual fact, anything of this uh, nature is self-regulating. And in the worst case, it'll blow up. 
and it will become destructive and, and, uh, and, and destroy itself or not work, or it will settle down to some kind of stability. And I think the, the thing we've got to do is to make sure that that um, stability point is a useful one and, and something that's uh, <laughs> beneficial to us. Uh, and I always say this to people, you know, there are, we've never invented an evil technology. Uh, evil technologies don't exist. But if you take AI and uh, stick a gun in its hand, then put it on a robot and teach it how to hunt down and kill people, that's, that's, human, that's a human problem. It really is. And of course, the military are actually doing that. Uh, and this is just crazy. Um, on, the, on the other hand, um, my, my wife has uh, just had uh, a mammogram and uh, that uh, analysis has been done by AI. Uh, an awful lot of the, the drugs that are now being produced are produced by AI. In fact, uh, the chips in my mobile phone are made or designed by AI. The things assembled by machines uh, because people can't do it anymore. It's, you know, I mean, we don't have the um, visual acuity, nor do we have the uh, manual dexterity to make a mobile phone. We couldn't do it if we wanted to. Um, and so here we are. Um, the question is, uh, can we understand this stuff? And I'm afraid that uh, sitting around the table with coffee talking about it doesn't get you there. You've actually got to build it. And um, it, 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 it's almost like, uh, you know, if you, if you sat around uh, discussing uh, how you were going to control an aircraft but never made one, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get anything very uh, useful out of it. Uh, and so um, building and experimenting is, is always um, <laughs> eye-wateringly honest <laughs> and revealing. And so, in, this global, um, in this global petri dish, Peter, um, you know, are we deluding ourselves to, to sort of, um, you know, is it just, you know, we're just reassuring ourselves that we have the, the sort of delusion of control um, and, and we might be better to sort of sit back and see what it does? Um, I, I'm afraid I've been in that situation now many times. Uh, it, you know, uh, if, you, if you allow me one profanity, uh, it always amuses me. Uh, in, in the American teams I've been uh, working with, they always call it the holy shit moment. You know, it's a sort of, the thing just does something and you all look at each other and somebody shouts, holy shit, what was that? And um, those things uh, happen uh, increasingly in networks. And, and I, you know, I mean, I'm an engineer through and through. Uh, I was brought up on telephone networks that um, were very, very well behaved. And now um, the internet is not well behaved. And um, the, the IoT is uh, even more out of control. And um, the, the thing is, uh, there's no malevolence built in. Um, and um, in actual fact, um, all, all the, uh, the people who are getting all worried about AI and robots taking us out uh, are by and large the people who don't work in it and they don't understand it. Uh, and it's largely driven, in my view, by ignorance. Uh, rather than an uh, than actual fact or, or experience. And um, if something goes rogue uh, and it's causing damage, you know, it, it gets sorted out. And, and um, because, uh, you, know, you would like, uh, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, your car is increasingly an internet on wheels. You know, I mean, there are about six chips in, in my seat, let alone the door panel, and, and in, the, in the dash. And uh, as we go to um, electrification of vehicles, uh, we're gonna get a reduction in component count by about 60%. And, and so from a, an engineering uh, perspective, um, the, the key thing is to be able to make materials that we can use, exploit, track, and then as components, we can repurpose, reuse them, and uh, we can recycle them at incredibly high efficiencies so that uh, we, we, can, we can make a sustained world. Uh, that's what the game is. Now, without the IoT, we won't do that. Um, you know, at the moment, uh, we're consuming about uh, one and a half planets worth of raw materials every year, uh, and that's not sustainable. We have to do something fairly quickly. And so I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that, by the way, this is not being organized by any government. There's no governments involved in this at all. Uh, there is no plan. This 
The Industry 4.0 is an, an ideal example of an emergent property, if you like. It's, it's coming out of the woodwork. People are just doing it and cooperating. And I'm afraid um, that's going to be, I think, an increasingly uh, dominant model uh, going into the future. Brilliant. So, David Dewhurst, you've had your hand up for a while, and I, you genuinely have got your hand up this time, so I've got it right. Okay. Um, I think that you've got an absolutely great programme here, which should be pushed to its absolute limits. I suspect it's still doomed to failure. We're uh, equating computation with the emergence of sentience, raw fields, whatever. Now, doubtless, there is a lot of computation in my perception of feeling of red or blue or pain or whatever, but I still don't necessarily get how ultra complexity is going to uh, necessarily sort that problem. I mean, various people have suggested this is so complex, it's going to go this way, uh, systems lying on systems or, you know, collapse of, um, you know, quantum effects or, or microtubules and so on. And one tends to get so confused that one says, yeah, yeah, it must be uh, like that. But as far as I can see, the mind-body problem or the mind-sentience uh, problem still stands uh, is it can, can, worthy, uh, to contradict me yeah can i uh, quote uh, um to you you know from the uh, uh, sort of uh, literature if you uh, my dear watson you've made a cardinal error you're looking at this from a human perspective forget everything you know about the human perspective this is entirely about the, the way the machines uh, look at the world and so what you perceive as being your sentience probably has no relevance to a machine because you know that that's the that's the and, and by the way the next the next thing is yes please let's have some failures I mean the way you and I arrived here has been through genetic failures and, and chemistry failures right from the big bang and so I don't expect to get this right I expect to get it wrong but every time I get it wrong and I modify my model I'll be a bit closer you know it's yeah. a it's a pro uh, I think, you know, I've always been impressed by the power of iteration. It's always blown my socks off that, uh, you know, we, uh, my favourite example for, um, uh, for students is, you know, we, um, uh, we get a bow and arrow and uh, from that we're inspired to make a lathe. We make the lathe out of wood. Then we get some metal and we make a metal. And the, the accuracy gets better and better. And, and, now, and now, starting that, from that point, we've got this. Uh, it's just a lot of the stuff is counterintuitive. I worry about exactly the same things that you do, but I try and take my human stuff and put it in a box and try and isolate the machine bit and say, uh, or another animal, you know, what, what's an amoeba's sense of um, awareness? You know, I, I don't know, I can only guess. <laughs> so, um, but all I can say is what, I, what I've done accidentally, um, and this, uh, some of this now goes back 10 years. I, I, I'm going to confess something in a minute. Uh, but I, this, some of this goes back 10 years. And I had, when, I, when I first published this kind of thinking, I had a team from uh, UCLA came along. And they were sort of so excited because um, they'd been, they had decided that, that, that microbes were intelligent. But at that time, nobody would listen to them. And so they were, they, were, they were really quite quite pleased about that. So the, um, the sort of confession to you is that uh, I put this together and uh, about an hour and a half before you know, I thought, oh, damn, there's a, a mis mistake in the formula there. And I had to quickly go back and <coughs> modify it slightly. It was my fault. But um, the, uh, all I can say is the mathematics is um, painful, um, lengthy and wrong. Um, but it's, uh, it was, as an engineer, let me give you another view. We were killing each other really well with bows and arrows and cannons way before Newton came along. You know, we, and, and, and once we got the laws of motion. So I just think that if we uh, keep making errors and keep trying, um, my, my model might not be spot on. 
but it's a damn sight better than Hans Maravec and all the other guys. You know, so I... ...doing something, but I suspect the machine to which you infer, are willing to infer intelligence, would be rather like you and uh, me and <laughs> many other sort of living organisms we know. And infer yeah, it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just... I look and say, well, can imagine this. Um, uh, when, when you look at a plant, uh, the cells are crammed together. And then you look at an animal and they're spread out. And now you look at uh, the IoT and the internet, it's spread out right across the entire planet. But the time difference from sending a signal from a piece of IoT to it getting somewhere else is pretty much the same as something in our body communicating cell to cell. So just, um, is this one giant organism? I don't know. It sure looks like it. it may be can, I, can I come in there? Because I've got a question on that. So Francois Xavier um, has written, um, as IoT networks follow our societal networks and fill our needs and structures, is their own structure and dynamics a sort of mirroring representation? I've seen. I've not. I don't think I've seen that one. I've read. I've read quite a few um, things that other people have put together. And, and shall I say, there's a, a fog of information. And um, I'm going to now quote my old research professor. You know, there's only such so much reading I can do before I've got to go and do something. <laughs> I have to go build one. <laughs> um, um, Paolo, you your hand up a while. Hey, Paolo. Hello, thank you very much for the amazing uh, presentation and, and discussion. Oh, I'm a bit lost, I have so many things, but I, I have one bit, the first thing that occurred to me is, with the knowledge that of fractals that we have now, do we still have to think of a Big Bang? Can we still think of dis discrete beginnings and ends of things, like the beginning of life and the cessation of life? The answer to this, uh, I don't know. You know, we've, we've got a big problem. We, we've come up in a sort of Mickey Mouse world of you get a problem, you analyze it, you get a result. Or, you know, or, or you've got the result and you can get back to what the problem was. And with, with fractal things, it's a one-way ticket. You, uh, a good example would be a, a Japanese sword. Um, you can certainly take a billet of metal, you can hammer it, you can flatten it, and you can keep folding it and you'll get a pattern. If I do one and give you the pattern, you can't figure out how I folded it. You know, we just can't do it. We can't do it mathematically. We have no means of doing that. The only way we can do it is to, to use something like a quantum device that explores every possible folding mechanism and looks what the answer is. You know, so um, uh, another good example is um, you know, the, um, the seat of all disease uh, in human beings is a communication failure, uh, failure between uh, the genome and the protein. Uh, we can't see that yet, and we don't know how to get there. But you can bet your bottom dollar that that is going to be another fractal kind of problem where it goes one way. We'll have knowledge in one way, one direction, and we're guessing in the other direction. And so, and when I when I give talks on quantum computing. Uh, people are quite surprised that one, it's analog, and two, it doesn't give you a precise answer. It gives you a bunch of probable answers. Then you have to throw a big supercomputer at it to find out which one it was. Uh, and, and so we're, we're, we're in a sort of interesting corner. I, you know, like a lot of people on this call tonight, and, and a lot of people in engineering and science, I was brought up in a strict mathematical regime, and I think that way. And it came as a shock to me when I, I discovered fractals. And I found it was a one-way ticket. I could compute it, but I couldn't go backwards. And biology is like that, all of it. And um, you know, the, uh, I mean, the human brain is fundamentally a quantum computer, as is the human body. And so uh, if we're going to actually model it, we're going to need some, some power of that kind. And I, by the way, I'm not at all certain we're going to get quantum computers that are really going to work well, big enough. So, so uh, while, 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 while you're on that one, James Bryant, I can, I can uh, see a couple of good questions coming from you. Uh, do you want to start with your, with your first one about the, uh, the actual example, James, and then, and then go on to a second point? Yeah, sure. Hi, Peter. Hi. Uh, can, can you give us an actual example of an IoT doing something that it's not been programmed and it's outside of its parameters to do? 
Oh, yes. Uh, um, actually, uh, connecting with something it wasn't programmed to connect with is a good example. So, but, but like, could, uh, but like, like what? For example? Um, like, um, you could have all the components in a vehicle. Uh, or, or um, in, in some kind of um, uh, piece of uh, military equipment, and it suddenly decides to latch onto something that's in its in, in close proximity. So, uh, you know, let me just be clear. What actually happens is uh, people see the IoT as being all wireless. Not the case. An awful lot of the IoT is wired. It's certainly wired in a lot of vehicles, and it's wired in lots of structures and it's wired um, in some smart, smart materials. Uh, and so uh, spontaneous handshakes happen, uh, uh, but it's a sort of surprise. And uh, on a bigger scale, uh, spontaneous connection between complete uh, colonies uh, happens. Right. And, and I think we can just look forward to that. But uh, th th they can't connect if there's not a receptor, basically. So. Um, you know, it's, it, uh, uh, two things, they both, they, they both need to be able to make a handshake, which means they both need to be able to connect yes. to each other. So yeah. it's actually human, hu human lack of programming. Oh, okay, let me, let me, let, connecting, yeah? okay, let me give you a really blindingly obvious one. Okay. And that is uh, all the products that are being rolled out for the IoT right now have virtually got no uh, um, security on them. Yeah. And so, and so uh, uh, there's virus, uh, viruses are all over them. And yeah, so, difference between, a, difference between a, a, a cooker and a bomb is the ability to hack it. So, literally. Hence, well, I, I, hence I, Microsoft's, Microsoft's inbuilt security process that they built into their Azure chip. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, uh, like a lot of things, they're, they're coming out of uh, shops, shops in uh, China, and um, you know, the security is not being built in. I mean, even the automotive trade, the security on most cards is absolutely pathetic. Um, sure. and, uh, and so, you know, there's, there's windows of opportunity. Um, I mean, my, I mean, my, my view, my view of security is, uh, death comes from a direction you're not looking by a mechanism you didn't anticipate at a time that's really bloody inconvenient. And, uh, it, it, it's always like that. You and I can sit down and design the hell out of a system and somebody will come up with something because we didn't think of that path. Sure. Yeah, that's, a really, that's a really good point for me to come back in because what we started with, because um, you know, we're, we're getting you know, 20 minutes or so from, from, from winding up, um, where we started in this conversation was, was Abdul um, proposing a, a viable operating model, a means of of creating an architecture or generating an architecture for a, a very specific organization, so you know, an organization with a customer and, and acting with intent. And then, Peter, you've talked about, so you know, wake up, Abdul, because I'm going to bring you back in here, mate. Um, you know, we've got you, you, Peter, saying, but it's, it's kind of out of control. This is sort of, if you like, a delusion, um, almost in there. That, you know, we, can, we can try and create the illusion of control, but we can't really have any. So, uh, Abdul, with your um, you know, customers don't want to really know about architecture, um, is, is there a sort of, uh, is there an inference from what Peter said that says we, we need to rethink the way we approach our customers? Could I, could I just preface this before we get into this conversation? Because this is the difference uh, between an army of redcoats and the SAS. The army of redcoats march forward in lines and the SAS are given a pen knife and a photograph and it says, go kill this guy, off you go. No control, no plan, they just go with what they've got. So that, that, that's, so in some companies, it's very differently guerrilla warfare. In other companies, it's definitely the rip codes because, I mean, I've, I've run production lines. You do not want people innovating on a production line. You want them to do the same thing over and over and over every day without making a, a mistake. But if you are in a creative shop and you have some uh, mini Hitler kind of control freak trying to run it, it won't be creative. And the trouble is with the human race, they want a one-stop, one you know, one-shop solution to everything. And, and it, there's, there's quite a, a grade of difference. 
I can see David uh, nodding his head on here. He's been there, done that. <laughs> how, how does this influence your thinking, Abdul? Where does that, where does that sort of take you when you so, look at this? So, so, so it's an interesting stuff. So the concept of control, I mean, I, I first remember kind of reading um, or trying to read pretty much everything I could find in stuff be and the idea of what we mean by control. So nature's idea of control and the way we think about control in business are, are quite different. So we tend to think about, you know, extrinsic control, something you bolt on as opposed to it being baked into the system, right? Um, so so that, that, that's the first, first point. I, I don't think the viable operating model is about mechanistic control. It, it's almost, it, like, that's what I mean. It's almost about intuitively being able to channel variety and, and understand variety. I think we exchanged an email recently where, you know, we said the customer will do what they want. Uh, what, 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 you know, ultimately they, they'll do what they want. We, we just need to find mechanisms to be able to reasonably uh, be able to deal with what they want. Um, I guess another way of putting it is, is this, if, if, and I've never offered this to, to my clients, but if I gave clients the, the gift of foresight or adaptiveness or agility, which would you take, right? I know which one I would, um, but... And that's really, really, really the point. So we know, we, we know we live in a world that's complex and increasingly interconnected and, and, and things can happen. But at the same time, there's a certain amount. We, we, can, we can prepare for, for adaptiveness, uh, as it were. But, you know. and, and I guess the, the, the final point really is um, there is a, there's almost um, a worldview, right? You can, if we think about how the world, you know, we had this mechanistic, deterministic worldview and, and, and then the kind of biological worldview and then organizations as systems. Mm -hmm. and, and, and my thought isn't that necessarily one is right or wrong. They're just different ways of looking at the situation. Um, uh, and just to kind of talk to some of the things that Peter's saying, I, I work a lot on, on a lot of data analytics programs. Um, and, and in some respects, I, I, I feel, and this is my opinion, that there's, it's like determinism's coming back. <laughs> you know, we think that if you know enough data points, um, um, you can you can predict a specific next best action, um, so that also needs to kind of be taken into consideration uh, 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 as well. So you know, more technology and more data doesn't change the fact that we live in, in a world of uncertainty and, and change and complexity, as far as I understand it. And you know, or, or, you know, relativity and all that good stuff. It, it in some respects it feels like we're going back to the world of kind of Newton and mechanism and, and, and stuff so anyway I blather on <laughs> blather away it's a it's a I don't think there are any easy answers to this one um because I'm, I'm sort of thinking about um uh, and there's really a, a question for both of you so, so, so Peter there's a sort of element the thing um because we've plugged it all in it kind of takes on a bit of a life of it of its own um the viable operating model is saying to us but we can have some directedness to that so how might we take the ideas of, of, of everything is connected and, the, and, and, and the, the things that you've been describing and use that to inform an approach to, um, let's say, more adequately directing the evolution of our organisation and our society? Yes, I'm always oh dear, Somebody needs to be on mute. Thank you. Um, uh, more adequately directing, if not managing and controlling, so that we create the conditions that, that make the whole thing sustainable? You have, you have to remember that, um, uh, I mean, what Abdul is, is doing is exactly what I do as an engineer. We strive for some efficiency. We, we don't want to waste resources. We don't want to waste... Uh, Mother Nature doesn't do any of that. <laughs> Quite the reverse. She wastes and can afford to waste huge amount. Uh, and the, the inefficiency is what, what makes the system so uh, very resilient. But she's not adapting like we are. You, you have to look at the, the rate of adaptation, adaptation and technological process versus a almost static biological world. It just does what it does and it lum lumbers along. I, I, I've got one quote for you and it's from Jurassic Park. Uh, Life always finds a way. Life always find, finds a way, and and uh, and uh, self-organizing technology may well be in that to uh, be. It may find a way. So, um, so when you say self-organizing technology, um, is it? And I actually wrote this down because I to make sure I structure it right. Um, when we talk about artificial intelligence. Um, 
are we at this point at least saying um, you know, that there is, there is innovation which is independent of the human architect, or are we saying that AI actuates or realizes the possibilities that the, archi the human architect built into it? Okay, let me, let me give you the break point. <clears throat> the second rung of the AI ladder, uh, we got our first foot on that a um, couple of years ago with Go, uh, the game of Go, um, because the, um, the AlphaGo team, uh, which is a British company um, uh, that was bought out, um, recognized they couldn't program uh, to make a, a, a Go program. And they, uh, they let the, um, the AI observe. And it was the first AI, uh, um, AI that observed, learnt, and then programmed itself. Well, you know, if I, if I had to make a one-line statement about what AI is really good at, it's pattern recognition. And it's so good at it, it recognizes patterns that we don't see. End of, you know, end of discussion as far as I'm concerned, therein is its value. There's a shed load of people out there trying to reconstruct a human being. I, I'm absolutely not interested. You know, we'll learn a lot about building human beings. We've got 7 billion already. You know, 7 billion and an artificial one doesn't excite me. What excites me is an AI that thinks differently to me. And, and the benefit of this, I, I think, is uh, legion. Uh, if you've worked in um, uh, mixed gender teams, uh, that are international and multidisciplinary, it's absolutely magic. The capability is phenomenal. Um, if you get in a, a team of mathematicians, then uh, it, it's not, one, it's not as exciting. Two, there's always a, a prima donna. And, and two, it becomes very monotonic. Uh, there's not the creativity there. If you slap an engineer in the middle of a mathematical team, it gets very lively, I can tell you. Um, it changes the nature of the, uh, the game. So I have been saying for the last nearly 40 years, I need an extra team member and the team member is AI because I need stuff that thinks different to us, please. Thank you. So um, Angus, you've had your hand up a while. Uh, if you'd like to come in. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for two really interesting talks. Uh, I have a question, which I'm going to initially direct at Peter, but I'm actually asking both of you the same question. And it's around this subject of efficiency. And the start point, Peter, was, are you really saying that nature has no efficiency? And as you develop your answer, is efficiency the only way of asking this question? Could we talk about effectiveness? Could we talk about elegance? Could we talk about productivity? And as we do so, um, I think of some examples. I think of, for example, the repetition of patterns with adaptive modification. How would you describe that? I think of the fact that I've observed any number of trees where one tree does not grow in such a way that it grows branches and leaves in shadow of another tree, but rather it adjusts its growing to the availability of light. And thirdly, um, the, the presence of what I would call productive redundancy inside nature, and I compare that with organizations that have in very many cases diminished that productive redundancy and then find themselves in all kind of trouble when they're put under some kind of stress. So I'm just wondering whether we might need to actually adapt our concepts of how we think about nature in relation to, to this efficiency notion, which is a very engineering one. Okay, um, let me say a couple of things. First of all, um, from an engineering point of view, two key parameters that are really important are reliability and resilience. And so I'll give you one example. A Formula One F racing car is optimized to hell. It's unreliable and it's not very resilient. Um, let me now give you one from management. I have been into no end of companies and said to them, please stop optimizing. And it starts with, this product line is not doing very well, we'll scrap that. And they, they zoom in closer and closer. There's some classic examples. Hewlett Packard was one of my hero organizations. I met both Hewlett and Packard. They were brilliant uh, businessmen and, and engineers. 
And what they did was followed the Romans, they divisionalized by blocks of 100, 100 guys in, in a, a building that had a, a business. They were top dog in um, medical uh, hardware, software, and education, and control systems, and so on. But they had uh, you know, one MBA uh, genius in after another that said, well, this, this factory is not doing very well, close it down, we've got to get more efficient. And they finished up with nothing. And, and the final stroke was, uh, we've got to get out of manufacturing and making things, and we've got to get into being uh, uh, providing services, um, which was echoed later, there I say it, by Margaret Thatcher, uh, in, and we were going to be a service industry. So um, I'm not coming from a different place. I'm, I'm coming from a different place to you a little bit, but I'm with you. I, I, you know, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that um, if you have no uh, redundancy, uh, and, and no relaxation and, and no ability to change and move, you're going to die. You, you, you efficiently, efficiently kill yourself. And so the, it's about getting uh, the balance right. Um, I've, I've worked for many, one of the organizations that I work for uh, is Facebook. And um, that is a really interesting place. And um, it is the epitome of um, being out of control. But creating a, a fabulous business and, and great products and so on. And so it, it, it's, um, let, me, let me give you another example. When I, when I was head of research in BT, I split my team up into four pieces. 30% uh, of the guys were wearing brass helmets and red coats. They were the fire brigade. Get out there and fix the problems that are killing the company that no one can help us with. And another 30% were on uh, get some stuff that's going to make products in the next two to three years. Another 30% were looking at the changes coming in the next 72, 10 years that we needed to think about and we needed to get some solutions in the pipeline. And 10% of the people, I just gave them a lump of money. I don't care what you're doing, but do interesting stuff. Actually, we got more out of that 10% than the other 90%. I mean, we are sure we were saving the neck of the company, but that great big lump of 10% uh, of, of the people that was total chaos disorganization from the outside was brilliantly creative. And so we were early into um, ant colonies and um, entomology. I was, in, I was hiring entomologists nearly 40 years ago um, because... Um, and we were looking at slime molds and things like that because uh, they were solving network problems for us faster than uh, we could do it with any, any other method. So I, I, you know, I don't know how to do this stuff. Uh, I, as, as let me, you know, come clean. I just experiment and I change real quick when I see it going badly wrong. But I, uh, I don't, I think it's another cultural thing in the UK and Europe to fail is a crime. In uh, the United States, you just learned something and it's valuable. And, and so I mean, having spent an awful lot of my time working in Silicon Valley, I've, I've really got that mindset. I will experiment. If it fails, I'll adapt. Can I take that then to Abdul? Because that was the other, the same question, I think, um, Abdul, for you, yeah. please. Um, yeah, I think so. Just to kind of, I think I'm echoing Peter's point about, so we live in a world where, and we've known this for a while, that it's complexity and the rate of change Kind of in a in a vicious loop because it's not virtuous and and the lack of relaxation period which is causing the problems but the point around efficiency and effectiveness is really important so i i did i probably didn't emphasize it enough but it, the value stream is really about efficiency and effectiveness and in the right order i think john you describe it as doing the wrong things writer um, and i kind of present it to my clients as you know you've got efficiency and effectiveness typical management consultancy grid and, and you get four quadrants you know, one is die slow, one is die quick, uh, one is survive and one is thrive. Um, and it's a question of, you know, balancing the here and now uh, and, 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 and the there and then. So it's, um, I suppose another way of putting it is, you know, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, if, you, if you're a nostalgic type person and you're, and you're always stuck in the present or the past, you'll never be able to create the future. But at the same time, if, you, if you're stuck in the, in, 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 you know, we're not stuck. If if if, you, if you're, you're projecting into the future, it's like that Benjamin Franklin saying, right? You know, vision without strategy is just hallucination. So you've got to find that balance. Um, and in practical terms, what what does that mean? It, it means that you explore and and you exploit 
and you've got to get the feedback to know at what point you can move between these different things. And isn't that the best thing about organizations that we can organize ourselves to do those things with, with tentacles in different ways and in, in a way that an individual can't. And there's yeah. always that guy or gal out there that surprises you, Abdul. They do stuff you didn't expect, right? <laughs> I, love, I love the notion that vision without strategy is just hallucination. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I could have, I'm certainly going to quote you on it, Abdul, at some point, because I, I do yeah, rather like that. Um, David, you've had your hand up, and then we're going to be running out of question time, I think. OK. Um, in my efforts to sort of link gear, uh, gear systems and organisational su systems with the perceptions of the intelligent entities um, composing them, would an appropriate formulation be something like the structure of the system evolves the human components, which then enables or requires a restructure of the system. I mean, my example as a teacher would be you start the year as an autocrat aiming to be the alpha monkey. And by the end of the year, you want to have anarchy uh, or you know, nice anarchy, uh, moving from sort of martinets to sort of creatives and um, ever thus. I, I've sort of been in education with one foot for a long time, and um, <clears throat> I, um, I was faced with an interesting situation where uh, uh, one of the companies I was working for was attacked by Trump, uh, followed by Boris beating them up, and, um, and then there was COVID, and then there was Brexit, and I thought, if there's a time to go into academia, this is it. So I've moved into academia, and I've had the joy of um, teaching regularly. And um, I, I think I, I quote uh, you know, sort of Richard Feynman on, uh, uh, on quantum mechanics, and I'd say the same about uh, you know, uh, uh, teaching. Um, I think we can safely say that no one really knows how to do it. <laughs> so what, what I've insisted on doing in my teaching is I put demonstration, I've actually gone back to, to quote Abdul, I've gone back in time and I've gone back to Faraday and Boyle and those guys who never gave a lecture without giving a demonstration. And so I have actual demonstrations in class. And one of the distressing things for me was um, they, they, these young engineers don't do laboratory work anymore. But um, I've, um, I've, I've built stuff, I've got uh, laptops with a horrendous array of uh, electronic uh, radio equipment on, and they'll sit there in a coffee shop in downtown Ipswich, looking nonchalant with a, a four-foot antenna coming out the middle of the coffee table, doing uh, actual measurements on uh, the occupancy of the radio spectrum, um, because um, I'm trying to enlighten them, and there's nothing quite like getting your fingers on and doing it. And um, I always think of our education system and I have uh, 10 grandchildren, uh, the vast majority of them are little people. And they're going to school and they're bright and they're energetic and they're inquisitive and they're just raring to go. And by the time they arrive at the university, it's been beaten out of them. And um, I asked my first class of engineers, I asked them one question, how many of you have taken the lid off a toilet? Not one. I go, what's the matter with you? You know, I mean, so their, their first assignment was to take lids off toilets and figure out how they work. And uh, I'm shocked. And, and part of the problem is, you know, you can't take these to bits now. And if you do, you can't figure out what it means. And so they're not used to that kind of inquiry. So that's my, my approach, I'm making it more holistic and a little more uh, tactile. Um, but it's, it, you, you, you're right. I, I don't know how to do it. I'm trying. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm adapting as I go along because some things work and some things don't. I don't know of any other way of doing it. Less control, Thanks, more engagement. Sorry, David. I'm going to intrude, David, because we're, we're, we're rapidly running out of time. Is there a final comment from you, Abdul, um, on, on anything? Are you uh, said enough for tonight? Um, I, I had a, a whole series of thoughts, David, from, from what you said and what was Peter was saying. But if, 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 if it, um, I might just say one thing. Um, uh, around uh, this idea of uh, what organisations are for, um, and, and it's and it's really you know about maximising the autonomy of the individual with, within some limits of, of whatever cohesion is, um, um, 
and I think that's the real question. If, if organisations are there to amplify our variety and in many respects help us to complexify ourselves to meet the world as opposed to just simplifying things, then 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 um, it. It's it's within our gifts. I would I, I would suggest to try to organise better for that purpose. Yeah. Um, uh, and then you, then you get into our realms of you know are we part of the system or or, or, or are we or, 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 or are we just a cog in 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 in, in the system? So I'd like to take through coffee sometime, Aldo. Uh, that, that'd, that'd be great. As as <laughs> well, we'll make we'll put the pair of you in proper contact and make sure that that can happen. Um, so, um, Angus, would you like to talk about the event coming up on the twenty third, please? Um, then it'll come back to me, and I'll talk about a couple of other things before we get to seven o'clock. Thank you. You're on mute. So I am. Thanks very much. Yes, Tim Faulkner. He's an Australian. He has a background in cybernetics, in town planning, and is a lawyer. He's a, uh, so his background is, to begin with, in law. Uh, he got into cybernetics and he got into town planning. He was also involved in the government in writing acts of parliament and writing laws. So he got involved in the whole process whereby you script legal structures in order to bring about certain kinds of outcomes. Then he went to work in town planning and social design. And what he's going to talk about, if I, if I am hoping what he's going to talk about, <laughs> the interaction between the, the structures and so on of the law and what we can learn from that in, in creating order, town planning and design and what we can learn from that. And of course, how the cybernetics fuses into that and how they inform cybernetics. Brilliant. Thanks, Angus. So everybody, that can be booked on Eventbrite, the same place that you booked for and registered for tonight. Um, I will add to that, that that next month we are being joined by Kerry Lunny, who is the president of Incozy, um, who's got a somewhat challenging title, which says Exploring the Future Marriage Between Cybernetics and Systems Engineering. So I feel a bit of tension coming on in that one could be quite fun. Um, and that will be joined by, or followed by um, Professor Brian Collins, another honorary fellow, um, who's talking about insight, foresight, and hindsight, the provocation on resilience. So that should again lead us to a sort of fairly um, interesting set of, of challenging conversations. So again, book that on Eventbrite and please do come and join us. So that leaves me to say a, an enormous thank you to both Abdul and Peter for some really gripping stuff, which I will confess I have to take away and reprocess beyond this event because there was too much to handle in, in, in a couple of hours there. It's been, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I think you all have looking for the, the comments. Thank you very much again for coming this time and we'll see you all on the 23rd and the 10th. Thank you very much. <laughs>